Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. SHN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Welcome executives to the Sports Film Pitch Podcast, part of the Sports History Network, where we bring you Hollywood's next sports movie. We tell you the true stories that are ready for the big screen. Giving you the cast and including the trailer from the movie trailer guy. And this week we are going over a name that will live forever but no one will remember the picture. And that is Tommy John. First picture to do the Tommy John surgery. Who was he? Do you know how good a pitcher he was. Do you know how long he pitched? How the surgery worked? How it happened? That's what we'll get into today on the Sports Film Pitch. The Bionic Man, the Tommy John story. Who are we going to cast in this movie? Tommy John is an Indiana kid, just like me. We're really the same person. I'm going to play Tommy John. No, I'm not. Well, though I did say one one time. No, who we're going to get to cast this, or who we're going to cast in this, got to be someone that has a lot of skill. Because Tommy has an issue at the beginning of his career, his life, of stuttering. He has a bad stutter. So very much similar to the King speech. So, of course, we're going to get not that guy. No, no, no. We need someone that can portray someone Midwestern and also can portray a good, wholesome Christian vibe, as Tommy is known for in his family. And I think a character that has shown that in the past and has the look of Tommy John, even though he's a little thinner, but has the look, and that is Andrew Garfield. Andrew Garfield has been in many, many movies, most recently in Tick, Tick, Boom, a musical on Netflix, um, was in the amazing... Spider-Man in The Amazing Spider-Man and more recently the No Way Home Spider-Man and also got his big break in The Social Network. But the movie we're really holding from to give him this character is Hacksaw Ridge where he played a character that was a conscientious observer which meant he wouldn't kill by but he was a medic in a war and so this showed his religious values and how he overcame a lot to achieve a lot and I think that would really fit in this movie where through all his challenges he's also strong in his faith what we're really focusing on here and I think he's going to be great he's been in the action movies so he can be very physical and do all the pitching scenes that need to be done and everything like that next is Dewey's wife Sally Sally John is an important character very supportive supportive character in this movie and also very religious character as well and she's going to be there for the support throughout his life through the stuttering issues he has through the medical issues he'll have through a long career that he's going to have now this one may be controversial i was going through kind of looked like sally gave that vibe now this one maybe out of left field i'm going what she used to look like it what she should look like today. I don't know exactly what she looks like now. Because she has not been in a movie since 2011. That is Amanda Bynes. Known for her show on Nickelodeon, The Amanda Show. And also, she's been in a sports movie. She's the man with Channing Tatum. When she played soccer, so she's got that experience. She was also in Hairspray and What a Girl Wants. And also in the movie Easy A, which I'm kind of pulling from her character. That's an overbearing Christian character. 
And that's a little bit like what Sally is. And that's really what I'm pulling from. Not only does she have the look of Sally in that movie, but she also plays the Sally character as if, if Sally was a teenager in high school. That's what I'm pulling from. Now, that being said, Amanda has taken a leave of absence, had taken a leave of absence from acting, but now is wanting to get back into acting. So this could be her big break back into acting. It's a supporting role, and she doesn't have to be up in front, but she can really show off some of her skills that she has and make a comeback. So we're going to give her that opportunity. And lastly, I debated this one, but I, I just couldn't get past the look. And, and it just fits so, so well. Dr. Frank Jobby. Dr. Frank Joe. And who we're going to cast for this doctor, this innovative doctor that created a surgery that will forever be known in baseball, as well as, well as other life, but is a major source in Tommy's life and in Frank's life. So who's going to play this character? Well, what, what person do you think of? Kind of an older person in the doctor type, innovative. House in D, of course. So, of course, we're going to give you Hugh Laurie. Why not? He's going to play him a little bit different, a little bit more cocky. Well, I guess it doesn't have to be a little bit more. But let's just make that into it. I think that would just be fun. Kind of like a, it's a cameo, but not a cameo. He's playing a character that he's played, but he's not playing that actual character. But it's a similar type. I think that just fits. So let's let's have House and then Tommy Dunn would be why not? <laughs> so now let's get in to the movie. What man will not be remembered for what he did on the baseball field. But he will be remembered forever for the medical experiment he did to save his career and change baseball forever. Sports Film Fits presents The Bionic Man, Tommy John Story, starring Abe Garvey, coming this Thursday. So we're going to open the movie in a sale. Like the movie Sandlot. Picture that. So we're in Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana, to, to be specific. And there's a young 13 year old Tommy Jim pitching, having his way, doing really good. One of the best pitchers in the area. And we show him just experiencing just a little pain. He's a left handed thrower. And so he throws the ball. And he's like, yeah, feels weird. He just recently went from the shorter Little League mound to the longer mound and it hurt his arm. Okay. But what's he do? Rub some dirt on it and keeps going because he loves the game of baseball and he doesn't want to stop. And through this, we'll show him kind of having this stutter. This is something that he struggled with over and over throughout his life. And it's something that was very challenging for him. He was one of the greatest pitchers in the area nobody could hit him he wasn't even throwing hard he was just a great he had great pitches a great curveball and great accuracy he was good at what he did and usually if you're a sports guy that's great but he had this stutter and he could knock it over but as he pitched through through high school and it was gaining recognition pitching winning well over 20 games you would see his stutter slowly start to stop but when he gets nervous that comes back and he struggles with this this is where we see andrew garfield come in as tommy john he won't be tommy john when he's 13 he'll be in high school on so he's he's pitching and he actually is a great pitcher and basketball player good enough to get offer from kentucky to go play basketball there and so he is pitching in one of the final games of the season and actually a, a scout from the Cleveland Indians comes over to Indiana and sees him in this game and sees how good his breaking balls are. He doesn't have a whole lot of speed. He's pitching in the 80s, high 80s, which is okay. It's not 
great, not something that like catches your eye when you see it, but when he throws his curveballs, that's when they see that is a professional curveball. That is something that can make it in the league. So he talk, he, this scout comes up and talks to Tommy, and Tommy is nervous talking to a professional scout, and that stutter comes back. And the stutter's going to come back throughout the movie because whenever he's nervous, that stutter is just going to come back and be a challenge that he has to overcome mentally. That's a mental challenge that he's going to have to continue to overcome. And so he tells him he, he's got an offer from Kentucky. He's, he doesn't have to go pitch. He can go play basketball. He even pitch at Kentucky. And he says, we're going to sign you. And he agrees to go with the Indians and join their minor league system. And when he starts playing with the Indians, that's when he's going to meet his wife, Sally, who was played by Amanda Bynes. Truthfully, he meets her a little bit later, but this will fit in the narrative to help support him. We're going to show that when she's around, when she's there, that's when his stutter starts to fade away and he doesn't have to struggle to talk. His confidence grows and her support and her Christian values that she brings to him really helps him as a player and as a person so his stutter starts to fade away and we're going to show him struggling in the minors at first like we're going to show him having a coach like you're too slow your pitches are too slow throw harder 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 he's trying to do with every hand to throw harder and he's got no accuracy doing it and not getting even a full lap just getting over 90 a little bit and it's a struggle for him to really get to that point where he can be the level of major league pitcher that he wants to be. And he's struggling. And he, he, he goes to Sally, the Amanda Bynes character, his future wife, and he's like, I just can't do it. I can't, I can't pitch on this level. She says, you be you. What got you here? That your breaking ball. That's why they signed you. They didn't sign you because you were quick, because you threw hard. They signed you because you threw hard. Accurate and he threw amazing breaking balls. He takes this to heart. And truthfully, what actually happened, this was a coach for his minor league team that told him, it's like, it's not trying to throw so hard, you can just pitch. But we're going to give it to Sally in the movie. I think it'll sound better coming from her and giving her that supportive background. And so he goes on to have success, ends up winning nine games the next year with an ERA of 1.6, which is a really good ERA. And so he gets moved up into the next tier of minor league. It goes triple A is like the lowest, of, or single A is like the lowest of the low, then double A, and triple A is like those players are going to be playing the major league probably are going to be close to it. And so he actually shows success, but what happens a lot in minor league baseball is there's a ton of trades that you never hear about. It's because they're small trades that don't involve major league players. You can trade minor league players. And so you have no idea these trades are happening. They're all behind scenes. And so this is one of the things that happens behind scenes. And he's traded to the Chicago White Sox. And this is where he makes his debut the next year for the Chicago White Sox. As a relief pitcher, halfway through the season in 1965. And he worked his way into being the fifth starter for the White Sox. If you don't know baseball... They usually rotate between four or five starters for their team. That means they start the game each week or they start the game and that way they can stay fresh. So every four to seven days of pitching, then they can rest the other time. So their arm doesn't get too worn down. So he's being the fifth pitcher for that. And when you're not doing that, you're, you're a relief pitcher. And that's how he started. And that's where he first came in for the Chicago White Sox. As a relief pitcher, that's someone that comes in, pitches, I didn't even hear two to try to help finish the game. And as a left-handed pitcher, that's very important because they like to pitch left-handed pitchers versus right-handed batters because it's, it's harder to see the ball and harder to hit the pitcher. And so an easier out is what it is. And I will say, he didn't have a whole lot of speed and had a good breaking ball. But if he wasn't left-handed, I don't know if he would have made the major league. Being left-handed was huge for him because that can just change the game because guess what there's a small percentage of people that are left-handed and if you are any good at all you can make it 
in the major leagues. And that's really a great thing that he had going for him. And what really led to him having such a long and strong career. So he starts to gain some success to even to the point with the 1966 season, he has made the opening day starter, which is a very important thing in baseball. You're the opening day starter. That means you're their number one pitcher. You're the best pitcher they have. And so he's their number one pitcher that year. And he continues to have success. And he eventually works his way to being a quality pitcher. No one through the league has a quality pitcher. Not going not going to mow you down with, with fastballs, but going to kill you with the curve. And so he, in 1972, joins the Los Angeles Dodgers. And this is a big moment for him. A team that is on the rise, and he is on the rise, and he joins this team, and it really changes his perspective. He feels more comfortable. He feels great. He has camaraderie around the team, and everything is starting to go good. And he first year, he wins 11 games. In the next year, he wins 16. And then in 1974, he is 13 and 3 halfway through the season. Second in the league in win. He is on his way to be an all star, on his way to be one of the best pitchers in the league. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, pitching a game against the Montreal Expos, he goes to throw a pitch, as he always does. Nothing different about it. And then just pay. Hey, Right in his elbow. Such excruciating pain he's never felt before. He felt pain when he was 13 trying to move from the small pitching mound to the larger pitching mound. This was something he had never felt before. And what's he do? Rubs and dirt on it. All right. Oh, that was just a fluke. No, no, nothing happened. And he goes to throw another pitch. And the same pain comes. And the ball doesn't even make it to the plate. And he just walks off the field. The manager's like, what? What just happened? He's like, I can't. I can't throw the ball. He tells the manager, Tommy Lasorda. And Tommy brings you another pitcher. And he's done. He goes to meet with the team doctor. Dr. Frank Jove. Great by you, Lori. And we're going to make this character more of a Dr. House character. I know it's a little weird to bring in a character from TV into this movie, but... Really, what Dr. Jove does is unique in Dr. House. And he's not a surgeon, and Dr. Jove is a surgeon. And he was looking through the x-rays. They didn't have CAT scans, MRIs, all that other stuff that we have today that could see more muscle, what was missing. But there was no issues with the phone. And so he's, he's checking very doing different like tests with them. And he, he takes his arm in front of him with an elbow against his body, takes the arm and takes the hand in front of him and pushes it out to the left, away from his body. And if you do this to to yourself right now, you you can only go so far. Well, he went like extremely far, like almost perpendicular to his body, which is very hard to do, like, like it was nothing. I told him that he had experienced damage to his ulnar lateral ligament and what this meant was this painting career with over. this isn't something unusual this happens quite regularly in baseball not like so often that it's going to happen to everybody but many pitchers as they go pitching during their their career and he had at this point been pitching for about nine years in the majors and of course you got minors and little league and high school after, before that well it's a long time to be pitching and so Tommy says to the doctor, so what are my options? And Dr. Frank said, well, what other skills do you have? Because you're not going to be pitching anymore. And Tommy was like, no, no, I love pitching, pitching my life. He has his wife, Sally there, and they're like, this is our life. Our kids love baseball. Everything loves baseball. We have four kids and they all love baseball. Baseball's our life and we're not ready to give it up. He's only 31. Let's get to find a way to fix this. So Frank, Dr. Frank, doing his Dr. House stuff, is thinking about what is the ligament like? Well, it's similar in composition to a tendon. So what he does, he he takes a tendon out of his right arm, his non-throwing arm, and puts it into his throwing arm. 
his elbow. And he takes the tendon uh, around his wrist and moves it to his elbow. Now, this is not something that had ever been done before. Really, there was no reason to do it. You could ex a normal life, basically, without having this issue. You just couldn't throw a baseball close to 100 times a day, which is not normal for most people. And so you can live a normal life without having any surgery or anything. You just couldn't be a professional baseball pitcher. So he goes and he's like, I have no idea. I'm giving you a 1% chance that this ever works. 1% that this works and a 1% chance that you'll ever pitch again. I doubt you can pitch. This might make your arm better and feel better. But I don't know if you'll ever pitch. Tommy's like, let's do it. There's a 1% chance that I can get back on that mound. I will do it. So they go into the surgery and he takes that ligament out of his right wrist and puts it into his left elbow, connecting basically um, the bones back together into a what they're supposed to be like, similar to what that naturally is like. When he does this, he actually notices that not only is it like broken or that ligament in his elbow is broken. No, no, it's not broken. It's not in there. It's just like dissolved or evaporated, it exploded. Something happened. It's not there. It's fine because he's going to replace it, but still it's like eye popping that there's nothing there. Probably came from when he was a kid pitching, having pain, and just pitching through it. Probably why he couldn't pitch faster, even though he's a large guy with like large ligaments. He's 6'3". He can throw the ball decently, but a lot of larger pitchers can really throw the ball with a lot of speed with their weight and their size. And so we go to after surgery, after it's done. Dr. Frank comes in, touches his fingers, sees how they're doing. Well, on a good side, he can't feel his fingers. But Dr. Frank says, this is going to be a long process that we have no idea how it's going to go. There's a chance you may not get feeling back in your fingers. We've never done the surgery before. We have no idea what risk, what complications come from it or anything like that. But he ends up going back and checking his arm again, being a forced, forced surgery and connects and reroutes the nerve, reconnecting nerve he, he gets feeling back into his fingers and now starts a montage training montage of getting back to pitching and this is a long process this doesn't just happen overnight he doesn't pitch the entire next season now he's growing he's working his way up to throwing he's working his way up to pitching but he doesn't play a game and he works his way back up to where he's actually throwing pitches he come back to him pitching on April 16th, 1976. Almost two years since he first heard himself. Dr. Frank is there, Sally's there, kids are there, everyone's there. And they see and take them out. And everyone's like, is his arm gonna fall off? He, he's worked his way up. So they probably know his arm's not gonna fall off, but things can be different when you're pitching in a practice setting versus pitching in real life. Your, your adrenaline is higher, you're gonna throw harder, you're just, you're going to have a full different experience. And like, they're holding their breath. And he throws that first pitch. Strike. And then on, he starts pitching again. We show him having success as he goes. He ends up, that first year back, he ends up going 10 and 10, which isn't terrible. It's a good back of the rotation pitcher. I mean, he was a fifth starter when he first came into the league. Well, he's a fifth starter again. That's not bad for a guy that had his really experimental surgery and came back. And then the next year, he goes on to win 20 games, which in baseball is like a threshold. If you win 20 games, you're like known as one of the better pitchers in the league. It's a tough outing to win 20 games. You're pitching roughly 30 to 35 games a year. So you're winning two thirds of your teams. That means you're very reliable when you go out there. He goes on to pitch against the Phillies in 1977, the National League Championship Series. What this is, is the games before the World Series. He's pitching in game six. If they win this game, they go to the World Series. And this is where everything culminates. This is where the movie is coming to a head. We show him the first inning, second inning, third inning, fourth, going, going, going. He pitches 
a complete game and wins, sending the Dodgers to the World Series, winning the National League pennant. And this is his validation that he is back. He's ready to go. In the movie, after the game, we show him and Sally together. He gets with Frank Joe. This is success for both. And this is this is not just him. This is a change for all of baseball. It's no longer a death sentence to have an injury to your elbow. A death sentence to your career. And now we'll come to the epilogue of the movie. And it's saying that after the 1977 season, John went on to pitch 12 more years. Winning 164 games after he got the surgery. More than the, the amount of games he won before the surgery. And then we'll say Frank Joe, Dr. Frank Joe, was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2013. And it's been said over 500 major league pitchers have had the surgery and come back from the pitcher kid in the league. There is a change to the game of baseball. And we'll end with the screen. Tommy and Frank change the game of baseball forever. In the movie. Thank you, executives, for listening to this pitch. Let us know what you think. Should we make this movie? Who would you cast differently? And what stories do you think we should make next? You can contact us at sportsfilmpitch.com or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at sportsfilmpitch. Please don't be afraid to share. Tell your friends, hey, this is a, this is a great pocket. We go out, make your own sports story. It's ready for a movie, right? Make it happen. Look forward to talking to you in a couple weeks for the next Sports Film Pitch. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, Fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.